Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is, that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is, and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon you and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. This is the word of God. Um, just wanted to let you know, uh, Martin, in case you didn't know, Martin and Raphael are in Mozambique this morning. Uh, we have great cause for celebration with our brothers and sisters in Mozambique. They have 39 people graduating from Explore. And that's wonderful. Uh, the, God is doing an amazing thing up in Mozambique through Explore. People have, just have such a wonderful appetite for his word. And so Martin and, and, and Raphael are there to uh, extend our fellowship to, to our churches in, in Mozambique, the churches we partner with. And, uh, and so please remember them in your prayers. Um, Martin will be back with us next week. Then just to also mention uh, that as of next week, we are starting a series in discipleship from Matthew's Gospel. We really want to deepen our understanding of what it means to be a disciple. Uh, we want to broaden the scope of discipleship here at Christ Church Midrand. It's a major focus for us this year. If you come along to the uh, prayer and vision evening on Wednesday, I hope you're going to be there. If you come along, we'll be speaking more about it. Uh, you will hear more about it in due course here at the Sunday service as well. But uh, you can start reading through uh, Matthew's gospel this week and ask yourself the question, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And we're going to be spending time over the next six weeks trying to answer that question. I'll pray for us and then we'll have a look at Psalm 90 together. Father, we're so thankful to you this morning for the privilege of meeting with you, of gathering with you, and you've promised to be with us, uh, to be present with us as we gather through your Son in the power of your Spirit. What a privilege, Lord, it is to be in your presence and we are thankful for that. We ask that you would guide and lead our time together, that you would uh, open blind eyes this morning, that you would soften our hearts, that you would give us ears to hear. We know all of that is an act of God. We also know that the devil wants to snatch away the word. Uh, the moment it passes off the page of scripture, and so we pray that you will protect us, and we pray that you would uh, bless us with uh, true understanding, with life-changing, life-transforming grasp of the gospel this morning. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Have you ever felt, I just need to get out of this city so that I can think? It's January. Um, I hope you don't feel like that. Your boss may not be all that sympathetic. But from time to time, we all feel it, don't we? I need to get into the countryside. I just need to clear my head. I need to get out there. I need to pitch my tent. For most of it, for most of us here this morning, I need to check into my Airbnb. I need to get some peace and quiet just to collect my thoughts. Now, I'm not sure that's what Moses had in mind when he led the people out of Egypt, but that's certainly what he got. 40 years in the desert, you're going to do some thinking. 
even if the whole nation is grumbling in stereo, 40 years wandering around out there, and you're bound to have some me time. 40 years, you're bound to ask those really big questions, especially if you are Moses and you are leading Israel on what seems to be a road to nowhere. You're bound to ask at some point, who am I? Who are we? Where, where are we headed? What are we here for? Those are not unusual questions. In fact, they are the fundamental questions of identity and meaning and purpose that lie right at the heart of the human existence, the human condition. Most people at some point in their lives will ask those questions in some form or another, especially at the start of a new year. It's just how it is. We, we, it is a time when we do tend to pause and reflect and allow those big, scary questions to pass into our consciousness, even if it's just for a moment, before we turn to the inbox. Who am I? If there is a God, who is he? What is it all about? The good news this morning for us, as we reflect on Psalm 90, is that it's clear that these are the right questions. Listen to how John Calvin starts his most influential book, The Institutes. The English is old, but, but I'm sure we're going to get the gist of it. He says this, Our wisdom consists almost entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. But as these are connected together by many ties, it's not easy to determine which of the two precedes and gives birth to the other. For in the first place, no man can survey himself without turning his thoughts toward the God in whom he lives and moves. In the second place, those blessings which come to us from heaven are like streams taking us back to the source. The endless good which resides in God becomes more apparent from our poverty. Our miserable ruin compels us to turn our eyes to heaven. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying you can only truly know who you are by knowing who God is. And you can only truly and fully know who God is by knowing who you are. The answer to those two questions are bound up in each other. What's crystal clear is that Calvin had read Psalm 90. Because Psalm 90 is all about God and all about man and all about this mysterious interrelationship between God and man. Just have a look there. Have a look, a quick scan, and you're going to see that it's, it's blatantly obvious. Verse 1 and 2, what are they about? Who are they about? They're about God. Verse 3 is about man. Verse 4 is about God, and so it goes. God and man, man and God. So where do we start? Because Calvin says, has just said to us, it's difficult to know where to start. Well, let's take our lead from God's Word. Let's start where Psalm 90 starts. We start by gazing at God. And as we've just been saying, when you gaze at God, you learn a lot about yourself. In Psalm 90, we gaze at God, we learn at least three things. These three things about ourselves. At least these three. We are dust. We are damned. We are also dearly loved. We are dust. We are damned. We are dearly loved. First, we are dust. Verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In verse 2, we have God's eternity expressed in three escalating steps, reaching further and further back. He was before the mountains. God Almighty was before the mountains. In fact, he was before the earth and the world, all creation. In fact, he is God from everlasting to everlasting. God is eternal so that he could say to Moses at their first encounter, the burning bush, he could say to him, my name is I am. I am ever present like this burning bush, burning but never burning out. Time has no hold on him. To gaze upon God, to gaze upon this eternal God, we have to open the aperture of our minds like a lens, as wide as it will go, just to get a glimpse 
the vaguest outline of who he is, of eternity. It's like looking at a canvas, a canvas the size of the screen. Only your nose is up against the canvas. You have to strain just to take in a glimpse, just a glimpse of his grandeur, his beauty, his magnitude. And when you take your eyes off the canvas and you look down at yourself in comparison, all you see, or what you see, is small and petty, isn't it? Small and petty by comparison. Psalm 3 calls it dust. Look at verse, Psalm 90 calls it dust. Look at verse 3. We start as dust, we end as dust, and the God of eternity decrees it to be so. Verse 3, return to dust, O children of Adam. That title, children of Adam, gives us a clue as to why we are dust in the first place, and we're going to come back to that in just a moment. For now, the psalmist is making the point, God is eternal, and we are dust. Verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight are but as a yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. God has no end of time. Time is no object to him. A thousand years are like a day. It's 2020. Just cast your minds back a thousand years to 1020. I asked Martin about it. He remembers it well. <laughs> you can't tell him I said that. In the year 1020, the population of the whole world was 3% of what it is today. So if we have 100 people just sitting here in the front, there'd only be three of you. The button on your shirt wasn't invented yet. The pinnacle of technology in the world's most advanced economies, the most advanced economies, the plow. We've come such a long way. Or have we? See, in God's eyes, that was yesterday. Today's no different. We may have the iPhone 11, but we still don't have an app that can deal with death. Men are still dust, and they will return to dust. Steve Jobs is the case in point. In verse 2, we had those three escalating statements of God's eternity. In verse 5, we have three reminders of our mortality. God sweeps us away like a flood. We are like a dream. We are nothing but grass that perishes in the setting sun, replaced by a new grass in the morning. You remember yesterday's grass at all? When we gaze at God, we become acutely aware of our smallness, our brevity. We disappear like rushing water. We dissolve like a dream. We are dry by evening. Flood, dream, grass, dust. All of us. The weakest and the strongest. Cristiano Ronaldo is dust. Expensive dust. <laughs> but dust. Donald Trump is dust, orange dust. <laughs> Cyril Ramaphosa, Julius Malema, Helen Ziller, noisy dust. <laughs> God is no respecter of persons. You think you and I are any different? We are dust. God's not interested in our trophies. He's not impressed by the official title, your place in the organogram. The letters behind your name, in front of your name, your residential address, not too fussed, your bank account, your sense of humor, your good looks, the brands you wear or drive, the deals you've done. God isn't wowed by your CV, believe it or not. None of this changes our status. We are dust. So there's a cheerful New Year's message for you. And I think Moses was a motivational speaker. He simply spoke the truth given him by God. That was his mandate. That is why 
apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the prophet par excellence. He spoke the truth given him by God. And this is a hard truth, but it's one we need to hear. Because if there is one thing the Bible rejects, and by implication God rejects, it is human pride. In fact, our pride is the reason we are not just dust, we are also damned. Return to dust, O sons of Adam. Does that sound familiar to you? Return to dust, O sons of Adam. Let me just read a few verses from Genesis 3. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken for dust you are, and to dust you will return. We are dust and we are damned. In fact, we are dust because we are damned. We were made in the image of God for life with God, the good life, the abundant life, the full life, the life we are actually all chasing after, the life we desire in the depths of our souls. But now we are dust because we live under the curse reserved for a humanity that has turned its back on this God. We actually turned the offer down. Can you believe it? We had the garden. We opted for the desert. And so under the curse, we experience his judgment. You know, if you choose the desert, expect it to be hot. So Moses could say of Israel in the wilderness, verse 7, we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath, we are dismayed. Not a very politically correct message, but there it is. Are we any different? Are we just like them? We are just like Israel. We have no resources with which to face the anger of God. We have no way to appease him. You can't charm your way out of this. You can't sell God some sort of spin. We can't claim that we've been taken out of context. We can't cry conspiracy. We can't just deny the charges and promise to fight them in the courts. Because in the only court that matters, you and I are going to lose. This is no ordinary judge. You know, the language in Psalm 90 is of a people who are finished, spent, exhausted. They are empty. They are terrified as if an army is bearing down on them. In the face of God's anger, we have no resources. We have no excuse. Verse 8, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. What are your secret sins? Where are your secret places? What if you were being watched in your bedroom, in the pub, on your credit card? on your cell phone, filling out your tax return, on the internet, in your car after hours, in the privacy of your own heart, your own thoughts, your own motivations? What if someone was watching? Well, of course, someone is. See, the God who lives forever is also the God who sees everything, everything. Nothing is hidden from him. And because nothing is hidden from him, verse 9, all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Death casts such a long shadow over life, doesn't it? Such a long shadow that even the very best of our years, our, our glory days, even our best times bring pain because they are so short-lived. 
I mean, isn't that what nostalgia is? When we feel nostalgic, isn't that what we're feeling? You, you look back on some happy time in your life, some watershed moments, your wedding day, the birth of your firstborn. If you're a guy, it's that year your team won the title. You look back on those happy times, but there's always this splinter, just this hint of pain. Now, why? Why is there pain? It's a happy time. Well, because these moments are so fleeting. They're like water that we're trying to hold in our hand. These moments are so fleeting because you and I are grass and the sun is beginning to set. See, death makes a mockery of life. What does the bumper sticker say? Life's a dog and then you die. That's the family service version of an old classic. The English philosopher Thomas Hobbes, he said it like this. We had Calvin earlier, now Hobbes, I'm just saying. This is what he said. The life of a man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Now, he doesn't know it, but he's describing life under the curse. And his language is astoundingly close to what we read in Psalm 90, verses 9 and 10. Solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Perhaps the worst part of all of this is that we pretend it isn't real. Verse 11, look there. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? Verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. You see, we've convinced ourselves that none of this is actually real or it doesn't really apply to me. We are basically good. God is our friendly uncle. He's going to look the other way. He just wants us to be happy and rich. So we distract ourselves. We get busy with studies, career, flat, car, wedding, house, kids, new car, new house, renovations, extramurals, the promotion, weekends, holidays, retirement planning. Oh, yes, and church on Sundays. Because even if we live as if this isn't real, we like to hedge our bets. So church on Sundays. We don't number our days. We pretend the flood isn't coming, the sun isn't setting. When I wake from this dream, I'm not going to wake into a nightmare. We don't live with any urgency because death is not going to come to me. Don't you know how busy I am? I don't have time for death. I've got plans. And judgment, come on man, that's such an old-fashioned idea. We drown out the silence with loud music. We clutter and numb our minds with Twitter and Facebook and Netflix. We are terrified to be left alone with our thoughts. We don't ask the big questions. We don't fear God. We don't have a heart of wisdom. We are fools. If Psalm 90 is true, and we all know that it is, even if we suppress that truth, well, then our situation is desperate. As we look to God and we discover that we are dust and we are damned, and we are empty and guilty and utterly powerless to resist his judgment. Well, what's left? What is left to us? All we can do is what Moses did in verse 13. Return, O Lord, how long have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. See, Moses does the only thing he can do. He throws himself and his people on the merciful character of God. He pleads with God to turn back from his anger. He appeals to God's compassion, to his mercy, and to his unfailing love. This is the love of the covenant. It's the love that promises and never fails. The love that comes in the morning, not with the empty promise of a life that will wither, that will perish, that will end in death, but with the abundance of a love that satisfies 
forever. Verse 14. It's the kind of love that can make us sing for joy. And this joy, verse 15, is even enough to cover our affliction. It outlives, it outruns, it outlasts even our suffering. Instead of a life of dust in the desert, Moses turns to God and he asks that God will fill their days with gladness. And he does it on the basis of God's character and God's love. He knows we may be dust and we may be damned, but we are also dearly loved. He asks that God would show his glory to his people by acting for them. That's verse 16. And in verse 17, he begs for the favor of the Lord to rest upon them and to roll back the curse, even the curse on their work. And so he asks that God would make them useful, that he would use them and give their work meaning. In all of this, do you notice what Moses does not do? Because what he doesn't say is just as telling as what he does say. When he looks to God and he faces the crisis of the human condition, what he doesn't do is appeal to something in humanity. He knows we are dust. He knows we are damned. He doesn't start his prayer with, yes, but... Yes, but I'm not as dusty or dirty as this guy. Yes, but I go to church regularly. Yes, but I help at Nokopila. You know, I'm involved in the love boxes every year. Yes, but I come from a good family. Yes, but I'm a respected member of my community. I have good standing. No, every sinner here must, like Moses, recognizes, we must recognize there is no yes, but... There is no self-justification. None. Remember, we have no resources. In the truth of Psalm 90, we have no resources. We have no excuse. We have no recourse. We are dust and we are rightly damned. All that we can do is what Moses did. And that's cast ourselves on the loving, merciful character of God. Now, if you're feeling the weight of your sin and the weight of your mortality, well, we can be thankful because you're hearing the truth of Psalm 90. And Psalm 90 has wonderful news for us. You see, the prayer that Moses prayed has actually been answered. It's not going to be answered. It has been answered. God came to us in person to answer this prayer. He came in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses prayed. Jesus is the answer to that prayer. Jesus is the answer to our questions. Who am I? Where do I belong? Jesus is our dwelling place. Verse 1. Psalm 90 verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place. Jesus is our dwelling place. That is good news to those who are blowing like dust through the desert of this life. We have a home. We have a rock. We have a foundation. We have roots. They are in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our assurance that God is with us. We have a place. We have an inheritance. How can I face God with my sin? When Moses cries out, relent, O Lord, Jesus is the one who makes that relenting possible. Without him, it's not possible because God is just. He has to be true to his character. Jesus satisfies the justice and the righteous anger of God on that cross. And on the same cross, he satisfies our bottomless need for a love that won't fail us. That leads us to our next question. Do I matter? Does my life mean anything? Well, when Moses prayed, satisfy us with your covenant love, God answered in the Lord Jesus. This is how God loved the world. He sent his one and only son 
to that cross that whoever trusts in him will not end in dust, but will have eternal life. John 3.16. And as we sit here this morning, you and I, we are the broken wreckage of failed love, aren't we? In one way or another. We are all twisted, bent out of shape, battered, off balance, because people fail to love us. We fail to love each other. It might be your parents, it might be your friends, your colleagues, a teacher, the church, society at large. Someone has failed to love you. My friends, hear this. There is nothing in all creation that can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Nothing. If you doubt it for one second, look to that cross. Look to the crucified God and know that you are dearly loved. You. And so you can rejoice. We can be glad with a joy that cannot be choked or silenced by the troubles of this life. Whatever it is you're going through at the moment, however dark it is, however deep it is, it cannot separate you from the love of God. It cannot. And because it cannot separate you from the love of God, the love of God is anchored in that cross. It is an eternal reality, a fixed reality. You cannot be separated from the love of God in Christ. And because you cannot be separated from the love of God in Christ, you cannot be separated from your joy because the love of God in Christ is the wellspring of your joy. If you're looking for joy elsewhere, count on this, you will be separated from that joy. If your joy is rooted in the love of God for you in Christ Jesus, your joy is impervious to any challenge. It cannot be taken from you. Moses ends his prayer asking for the Lord's favor to rest upon them. And this is how that prayer was answered. You will recognize these words from Christmas time. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Terrified, dust, damned. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. You see, Moses prayed for the favor of God. God answered in the Lord Jesus Christ. He stepped into our curse to take our damnation on that cross. He rose from the dead so that we can rise from the dead, so that it doesn't all end in dust. He's the answer to our questions. He is the solution to the problem of God and man. He speaks to God as man. He says, I obeyed, I died, you can forgive them. He speaks to man as God and he says, I love you with a covenant love that will never ever fail. That leaves us with a final question. All of us here this morning. What am I going to do with him? This Jesus. For those of us who've known him for some time, we need to gaze at God again. See his grandeur, his glory, his beauty, his magnitude. We need to be reminded of who we are, how little we deserve to relate to him at all, and yet how wonderfully infinitely loved we are just how much he loves us we need to drink deep from the well of God's love for us in Christ Jesus and then 
we need to number our days aright. We need to see the urgency of this life. That our days are so few, that the time is so short, that it's slipping away from us. We need to ask God to establish the work of our hands in Christ Jesus so that our 70 or 80 years by reason of strength can count for something, can count for eternity. But maybe this morning is the very first time, it could just be the very first time you're actually hearing and acknowledging the crisis of your sin and your mortality. The human crisis, the human condition, the crisis of God's anger and your powerlessness to do anything about it. If that's you, you need to do what Moses did, what, all, what the rest of us have had to do and have been privileged to do over the years. You need to throw yourself on God's love, on his mercy, on what he's done for you. If that's you, you need to pray this prayer with me now. You can just pray it quietly in the silence of your own heart. Let's pray together. Father, I admit that I am dust and I deserve to be dust. I deserve your judgment. I am guilty of turning my back on you and I am so, so very sorry. I don't want to live that way anymore. Thank you, Father, that you still somehow, by some mystery I don't understand that there's more to do with you than me, that you still love me. Thank you for sending Jesus to rescue me. Please help me, Father, to put my trust in him and in what he did at that cross. Please rescue me today. Amen.